The codex that every guard player has been waiting for, or too little, too late. Find out more in this video. Hey guys, welcome to the video. Welcome to my review of Codex Astra Militarum. Kind of a bit, because actually there's a little bit more to review here. We have the Cadia Stands box set that Games Workshop kindly sent through to us. So full disclosure, they sent, sent this to me for free to review for you beautiful people. And I'm very excited for it. If you've watched the channel, if you follow the streams, you'll know that I am supremely excited for Codex Astra Militarum. Uh, we're not going to cover the contents of this box too well, apart from the fact that I've built a unit of guard and I've built one of the field batteries already, as well as the command squad, and they are stunningly beautiful kits. They are, however, very similar to the Kriegers in terms of the fact that they're not like stick-on arms. They're kind of monopose models that you can build in one or two different ways. A little bit sad if you're going to have 60, 70 guardsmen because lots and lots and lots of duplicate poses for Cadians. However, the kits are in fact beautiful and I cannot knock them for the work that they've done on these kits. So if you are new here, please be aware I'm very excited for the Astro Time Codex, but also make sure you go ahead and you hit that beautiful subscribe button for me. Hit the like icon button if you like the video. Do that at the end, of course, if you like it. And don't forget to hit that bell notification icon to catch every new video that we do, which aren't too common, but we do do five streams a week and it will let you know when we go live, so make sure you don't miss those. If you haven't seen one of our Codex reviews before, we do this a little bit differently to most other channels. We won't just sit here and read the Codex out to you for two reasons. One, it's really boring content, and secondly, it ruins that surprise for you when you pick up the Codex yourself. At the point in which this video goes live, there's a 13, 14 day pre-order time. It's a two week pre-order for this Cadian box, according to my contact at Games Workshop. So you can pre-order this box today. If you hit the link in the video description below, it'll take you to Element Games to allow you to order the box. Do that now because they haven't got tons of them. And it also tells them that you came from me, gives the channel a little kickback as well. We get 5% kickback for all of you people that use the link. Thank you so much. It's amazing the support we've had. Make sure you get this ordered now. You're going to want this book if you're an Astro Militarum fan. You might want this box even if you're not an Astro Militarum fan. But we do do things differently. So we won't read the codex to you in full. We will give you my 15 hot takes broken into five separate categories. We talk about the three biggest changes, the three biggest winners in the codex compared to the last codex, the three biggest losers comparatively, three standout units, and three favorite stratagems. I will add a caveat. This is all obviously my own personal opinion and what I think for the book. Different people, different people will think different units are stronger. Different people have different favourite stratagems. This is just my feeling about the Codex, about the book itself, and what I think is good, bad, terrible, fun, exciting, and interesting in the Astro Retirement Codex. So first of all, the Codex you get in the box is a limited edition Codex with some quite frankly glorious artwork on both the front and the back. The box itself is stunningly pretty. You get a big Cadia Stands logo on the side as you slide it out of its sleeve. It's it's beautiful, this box. It's very well put together. Whoever made this should be promoted, quite frankly, because it's so nice. Uh, it's a bit of a thick, chunky codex. Um, there's a lot of changes to guard, actually, and a lot of guard players will love it. A lot of guard players will hate some of the changes. Um, this has been long awaited. So do I think guard players are going to be happy with this book overall without spoiling the rest of the review? Yeah, I think you probably will, with a couple of little caveats which we will go over during the video. At the end, I'll let you know where I think this place is, how good or bad I think this book is, and I'll give it a score out of 10. That's the conclusion, however, so that's for the end of the video. Obviously, we're going to start with the three biggest changes for Codex Estaminatarum. Now, number one, the first biggest change is that there's no more regiments. There is kind of regiments, but there's no more regiments. What do I mean by that? There's no more regimental doctrines for specific regiments, okay? So in the Astro Militarum Codexes of old, uh, specifically the last one, if we talk about the last one from 8th edition, you have the Catachin Regimental Doctrine and the Cadian Regimental Doctrine and the um, Armageddon and blah, 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 right? You have Valhallans and they have specific regimental doctrines. They're the same as chapter tactics, essentially, for Space Marines. So it differentiates the different regiments like you would differentiate an Imperial Fist from an Ultramarine from Black Templar. However, in this codex, they've removed that altogether. There is no individual chapter rules for the regiments within the Astra Militarum. Instead, you have a single regimental doctrine, which is called Born Soldiers. Born Soldiers is essentially what we've got used to currently with Guard, in, in the sense that it is you can use an officer leadership if you're within six inches, and a six to hit in ranged, in ranged attacks 
automatically wound the target. So we've kind of got used out of Hammer of the Emperor anyway. It's become Born Soldiers. That is the regimental doctrine. And you can take that regimental doctrine. If, however, you choose not to take that regimental doctrine, you can build your own regimental doctrine. And there is a few pages of individual regimental doctrines. You get to select two for most of them. There is one or two that says you can only select one of these. You can only select this one if you haven't selected another regimental doctrine. And you can build your own regiment. Now, that means there is no Valhallen Regimental Doctrine, there is no Cadian Regimental Doctrine, there is no Catachin Regimental Doctrine. They have all gone. There's no individual stratagems or relics for these things. So it's wildly different to, for example, the Chaos Space Marines Codex. I actually kind of like it because it simplifies it a lot. It simplifies a lot of the interactions, arguably means that there's less balance issues internally with the Codex. But I also think that it's a bit sad that they've lost some of that flavour for in individual regiments. Having said that, that means that whatever you decide to build in terms of your regiment, your um, Astra Militarum, you can then pick and choose two of these regimental doctrines if you don't think you want born soldiers, and then you can kind of make it feel the way you want it to feel. So if they had have released a Talon doctrine that you disagreed with, because that wasn't how you envis envisaged your Talon working, you could then pick a custom regimental doctrine and make that fit instead, which is kind of better to give you some sort of freedom, I guess, but I think it will upset some players. Now, that being said, within the troop sections of the Astra Militarum Codex, you still have Catacin Jungle Fighters, Cadian Shock Troops, Death Corps of Krieg, and a normal infantry squad, as well as uh, conscripts. So there is sort of regiments. In those data sheets, they have their own individual special rules. So a six to hit with a Cadian last gun scores an additional hit. Krieg get mini transhuman, for example. So they have given some individual regimental flavor, but in your battalion of Astra Militarum, you can have three troops choices and you can legitimately have one unit of Krieg, one unit of Cadians, one unit of Catachins, use the Born Soldiers Regimental Doctrine. This is a full legal army. It's perfectly okay. I kind of like that. But some people that are, no, I'm just Mordians, here's looking at you, Mordian John, might not love it so much. Big change, no regimental doctrines, you have to build your own. Secondly, if we come away from infantry, but we look at vehicles and tanks, historically, we're all used to Lehman Russes rumbling forward a slow five inches because they had a rule called grinding advance. Grinding advance is something we've all got used to. If a Lehman Russ moves five inches or less, basically half its move characteristic or less, we should say, because obviously its move characteristic does degrade, it gets to fire its main turret weapon twice. This is gone. They've completely removed grinding advance because everyone would move the tanks half distance anyway to get two D6 shots with a battle cannon. But what they have done in removing grinding advance is remove the reliability of a lot of these big blast weapons. For example, the standard Lehman Russ battle cannon. It's gone from, 2D, uh, it's gone from D6 shots, 2D6 if you use grinding advance, to d6 plus three instead no grinding advance this means that your tank can now move its full distance and still fire d6 plus three shots i think this is a positive it makes tanks much stronger so a third major change is orders orders have changed wildly i don't think we're massively surprised by this they're no longer done in the shooting phase they're now done in the command phase which makes perfect sense um, that's a problem, you would say, if you had if officers in vehicles, but there are mechanisms that allow you to disembark from a vehicle and still issue an order. Orders can now be bounced, so if you pick a unit within order range and there's another unit that's the same that's within six inches of that first unit, they'll both get the order. And there's three different types of orders, so you get the standard orders for officers for infantry, you get the perfectus orders now, which are for commissars to issue orders to different troops, and they're different to the standard officer orders, and then you get the mechanised orders for tank commanders to give to other the tanks interestingly tank commanders they can't issue orders to themselves anymore that can't happen no longer will you see oh you've got two th three lehman russes are they normal lehman russes no they're all tank commanders and they're all going to give themselves an order that's gone now tank commanders get access to orders but they can only order other tanks they can't order themselves that's important it's a big change that one so orders have changed i'm all for it i think it makes more sense it's neater it's tidier it's it's the orders are, are kind of better overall i think there's more options as well so you won't just see the same order spammed over and over again i'm a big fan of orders now i think they're much much nicer there are little ways of manipulating them so there are certain warlord traits relics etc tank upgrades tank ace upgrades where you can have other things have orders so for example there is one that allows your super heavy your bane blade to become an officer issuing order type tank as well which is I, i'm really for that i'm really i want to now see Yarix. Bane Blade, all in black. We'll go into that one in a, in a moment. No, that's a, that's a, but orders have changed. Orders have changed. I'm all for it. I think it's a positive change. 
So now we're going to move into what I think is the three biggest winners in the codex. There are three. There are actually loads of winners. So this is just my personal picks for three biggest winners. Now, you, most of you will know I'm a tank fan. I'm a vehicle fan. You'll probably, <laughs> probably not be surprised to hear that my three biggest winners are all of vehicle type. I love tanks. Tanks are my thing. My first biggest winner, Lehman Russes. We've already sort of touched on this. Their firepower has just become flat more reliable. So a Lehman Russ battle cannon that used to be D6 shot, strength 8, minus 2, D3 damage is now D6 plus 3 shot strength 8 minus 2 flat 3 damage. Just flat more reliable, more like a battle cannon should be. That's better. They've gone up to 13 wounds. They've kept the 2 plus armor save from the balanced data slate. At the moment, they're going to keep armor of contempt because until they change the balanced data slate, Lehman Russes will still have armor of contempt. They obviously get issues from, um, or they get issued or or orders from tank officers and they can be given things like obsec. They can take track guards, which gives them plus one save against one damage weapons. They essentially get all his dust. They are tanks now. They're actual tanks now. They're good. And let's not shy away from the new Vanquisher battle cannon, which is a single shot. It is a single shot, but it's basically a rail gun. When I say it's basically a rail gun, it's a 72 inch heavy one, four, strength 14, AP minus five cannon that does d3 plus six damage it also ignores invulnerable saves and if it successfully wounds the target it does d3 mortal wounds in addition it is quite literally a hammerhead rail cannon but on a lehman russ we lost grinding advance on tanks but what we did do is we gained turret weapons as a new rule turret weapons is very interesting it is an interesting choice it's a narrative choice and i really like it so if you're shooting with a weapon that has the turret the turret weapon special ability you get plus one to hit so ballistic skill four lehman russes are now hitting on a three plus they have also degraded tank commander ballistic skill to a four plus but they have turret weapons, so they get to a 3+, plus, which means whether you're a Lehman Russ battle tank or a Lehman Russ tank commander, you are hitting on 3 pluses. Unless you're locked in combat, obviously. But they're blast weapons, Lehman Russ battle cannons, I hear you cry. You can't shoot them in combat. Well, that's the second half of the turret weapon ability. It allows you to shoot your turret weapon out of combat. Out of combat. So if you're tied up by gene stealers, for sake of argument, you can target that can't fix on its way over to you with your turret weapon even though gene stealers are surrounding your tank and although it's a blast weapon it's allowing you to do that you will suffer the minus one penalty for a heavy weapon but you get plus one for being a turret weapon so you're still hitting on fours out of combat i actually think tanks are very very good now the fact that you can make them obsec there's also an individual regimental doctrine where you can if you decide not to take born soldiers where you can make them worth five models at the same time obsec and five models on lehman russes rolling forward that can now move full distance because you don't worry about grinding advance all for it top demolisher cannons also improved d3 plus three damage instead of d6 damage so don't panic if you fitted all your tanks with demolisher cannons from eighth edition still think they're a solid choice lehman russes are a definite winner now in part because of the turret weapon ability my second biggest winner at the moment is super heavies uh why well they're free to take nowadays so because you share the astra militarum keyword you no longer have to play any command points to put a single sing super heavy in your list there are tank case abilities that allow you to gain like officer orders etc and allow you to order yourself and they have turret weapons turret weapons people so even a shadow sword with its with its tank destroying gun which is now flat 12 damage that has the turret weapon keyword despite the fact that it's a fixed barrel it's got turret weapons which means it gets plus one to hit which is very very tasty three plus hitting super heavies everywhere even bane blades bane blades still get 3d6 strength nine minus three three damage battle cannon shots but they are plus one to hit at all times hitting on threes that's really 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 tasty obviously like i said you can issue it orders uh, you you can give it sorry the officer keyword so it can issue itself orders and stuff super heavies i think they're kind of a winner i actually think they're looking really good right now i'm very excited to pull the shadow sword off the shelf and dust it down and run that in the krieg i think i need to pick up another bane blade after i gave mine to joe to run them in the guard as well super heavies have done well and the last one will probably be no surprises the last biggest winner in the codex for me and some of you may have seen our last wednesday the community update that came out the death strike the death strike is so good 
specifically the God Spear Warhead. So Death Strike's typically one of my favorite looking units. The idea that you just rock up with a V2 rocket with a nuke, old Commander Conquer style, and threaten to nuke your opponents excited me greatly. But in the old rules, they were kind of pants and they didn't really do anything and it wasn't really worth it. And sometimes you wouldn't even get to fire it. Well, they've made Death Strikes a lot more reliable. They've also made them a lot more killy. But there is a interesting interaction in how they work. So they're probably not going to do all that much killing simply because of how they work. So with your death strike that you deploy on the table, in your command phase, you do an action and you place a token somewhere in the opponent's deployment zone, let's assume. You place a token somewhere, right? Your death strike token. Uh, that action completes at the end of your turn. That's it. Done. You place your token. Your opponent then gets a turn. He can move out the way of that token if he wants to. If he doesn't, he's a brave man but he can move out the way of that token if he wants to i say he he she whoever you're playing against the, your opponent can move out the way of that token okay in your next turn you can choose to fire your death strike missile or you can choose to do the action again and move your token if you choose to fire your death strike missile depending on the missile that you've chosen you then get to roll a number of dice and things happen i'm going to revert back to my codex now because i want to make sure that you guys get the the truth for the death strike and exactly what they can do because this is i think this is exceptionally good but not broken a lot of people already disagree with me and think that it's broken remember your opponent has a turn to move out the way of that missile now in your shooting phase you can choose to launch the missile you've had to have selected the missile before the game starts so you can't just randomly pick which missile you want god spear is the one that everyone's gonna be taking right so you roll 1d6 for each unit within three inches of the center of this model's death strike target marker okay so if you've got six units within six within three inches of the center of the death strike target marker marker that's important for reasons i've gone to in just a second you want a d6 for each individual unit and then you apply the result so on a two to a three that unit suffers eight mortal wounds on a four to a five the unit suffers 12 mortal wounds and on a six that unit suffers 16 mortal wounds then remove the death strike target marker you only do it once. You fire that missile once, it's fire and forget, you're done. You're finished, right? So you can do, if you roll a one as well for each unit, nothing happens, they suffer no mortal wounds. So 8, 12, and 16 sounds like loads, right? But if you've got one death strike, your opponent can circumvent that. It's a three-inch range, which means it's a six-inch template, essentially. It's a six-inch blast template. So if your opponent just stays out of that six inches, they're not taking any mortal wounds whatsoever. If you place that objective marker, that sorry, that token, in the center of an objective marker, because an objective marker is 40 millimeters and it's three inches from the edge of the objective marker to be within range of it, not in the center, your opponent just toes on that objective. You're not going to be able to reach them if you've put your token in the center of the objective. So it's not that crazy. However, what I can see is you take two, maybe three death strikes with Godspear warheads. You can start move blocking your opponent's deployment zone just by sticking tokens down and going, go on a day, move in range of that. If you're clever with the placement of these, it's very, very good. There's two other missiles, you get a Plasma Barrage Warhead and a Vortex Warhead. So the Plasma Barrage, you roll a D6 for each unit within D3 plus 6 inches, so much bigger range. More deadly, of course, in, in that regard. However, they don't do quite the same number of mortal wounds. Subtract so 1 from the result if the unit is an infantry character. On a 2 to a 3, it suffers D3 plus 1 mortal wounds. On a 4 to a 5, 2 D3 mortal wounds. On a 6, it suffers D3 plus 3 mortal wounds. Then remove the model's death strike target marker from the battlefield. So, not as many mortal wounds, much bigger radius though. Interesting. Vortex is the last one. At the end of each of your shooting phases, if this model's death strike target marker is on the battlefield, roll a D6 for each unit within D3 plus 3 of the center of that marker. On a 2 to a 3, it suffers D3 mortal wounds. On a 4 to a 5, it suffers D3 plus 1 mortal wounds. On a 6, that unit suffers 2 D3 mortal wounds. Then roll a D6. And on a 1 to a 3, you remove the death strike target marker. On a 4 plus, do not remove the marker from the battlefield, but that marker cannot be used, moved using the aligned target action. Some interesting missiles. Death strikes, you're going to see them. If you haven't bought one by one, they're probably going to sell up. So, of course, I'm super excited by how many tank rules we've got and how exciting vehicles are now. That's cool. Unfortunately, with every new codex, some people lose out. Sometimes it's sometimes it's really, really hard to pick losers in a codex, and sometimes it's not so hard. This time, it actually wasn't that difficult. It makes me sad to say this, but we have got three biggest losers. We've touched on the first one a little. Individual regiments have kind of lost. Now, Valhallens, uh, not sorry, Valhallens, Krieg, Cadians and Catagens have some rules in this codex. They have individual units. You still have the Catagen Jungle Fighter unit. You still have Sergeant Harker and, and um, Colonel Strachan. Uh, you've still got a Death Corps of Quig. I say you've still got, for the first time ever in the Asher Time Codex, 
Um, in plastic, because they exist in the kill team, you have the death core of Krieg Infantry Squad. So you've got those. And you've still got Cadians. Of course, we've still got Cadians, despite the fact that the planet's been destroyed. And of course, all the new models are Cadians as well. And they've got some of their own stratagems that come with them. So there's a stratagem you can use on Cadian shock troops, for example, or a stratagem you can use on Catachin jungle fighters. So they have some flavour, but in the on the whole, because we've lost the individual regimental doctrines, we've lost a lot of the core flavour from the Codex, and I just think that's a bit sad. That means that individual regiments are a bit lost here. Now, if we're talking about people that collect Mordians or Valhallans or Talarn, people that have done tons of conversion work or bought all the old metal miniatures, they might feel a bit aggrieved by the fact that their codex no longer has anything that represents their particular chosen regiment whatsoever, and all they have to do is create their own regimental doctrine. It might mean certain people might go, well, that means that it's better for me because I can pick my own regimental doctrine, and actually my Mordians have just got better than they were before. I don't think that's the case, though, because if you remember, Mordians had their Mordian parade drill, but they also had the Hammer of the Emperor rules. Well, Born Soldiers is now Hammer of the Emperor, so you're only going to get what you select or hammer of the emperor not both for some people that's a bit sad makes them a touch of a loser i'm afraid not because you're losers for liking mordians but just because you've lost out on individual flavor every time people lose out on individual flavor it is a bit sad but i do kind of prefer it from a balanced perspective second biggest loser is a wyvern we've seen wyverns everywhere forever why they're a non-line of sight firing indirect weapon that does 46 mortar shots essentially uh, that can reroll wounds inherently. They've lost the reroll wounds. They're just not really worth it anymore, I don't think. When you consider how good death strikes are now, when you consider how good manta cores are now because they've just got flat three damage, you no longer have to pay for a tank ace ability to give them flat three damage on death strikes, not death strikes, manta cores. You just get it. We've already talked about how good Lehman Russes are now. And then you look at the Wyvern. There's just no real reason to take it. You've also now got the field batteries, which have just got flat better weapons, I think, than the Wyvern. I just don't think we're going to see them that much. Wyvern's a big loser. Not that bothered by it, to be honest with you. It's almost like they've sold what they needed to sell of Wyverns, but yeah, you probably won't see many of them anymore, in my opinion. The last biggest loser in the Codex. Sad time, people. Hats off. Over your heart. There's no Commissar Yarrick in the Codex. That model that Games Workshop have previously stated is immortal. And they've said that he's immortal because the orcs believe he's immortal. Not in the Codex anymore. It's gone. There's narrative in there. I won't spoil it for you. There's no more Yarrick. That's a lose. A guard Codex without Commissar Yarrick is a sad day. With that, we're going to move on to my three standout units. Things that I think in the Codex are very interesting and very exciting. Um, what's interesting in this particular occurrence is they're all new models as well. And I don't know if this feeds the narrative that people think that Games Workshop make rules to sell models. This would kind of agree with that. We're going to rattle through them. There is three exciting... There's a lot of exciting units. There's three that I've picked out, my three standout units. So first of all, we've got the Field Ordnance Batteries. They're a standout unit, but specifically with the Heavy Last Cannon option. Now, I've not taken the Heavy Last Cannon option. I'm building the Bombast Gun because it looks like a 105 or something like that. And I much prefer the fact that it just looks like an old artillery piece. So I'm building those. But I think the Heavy Last Cannon is the go-to option. So for like 140 or 150 points, you get two of those things. They come in units of two. You get two Heavy Last Cannons. Heavy Last Cannons are Heavy 2, Strength 9, Minus 3, D3 plus 3 damage. They crack vehicles open. They're very good. And so for just that 140 points, you get four of these heavy last cannon shots. I actually think they're really quite tasty. They're not super incredible. They're not amazing. They're not the greatest thing in the world. They're still guardsmen that hit on fours, but they're interesting. Not to mention the fact that you've got a mortar-based option and you've got that field gun. There's a lot of versatility. You can run one last cannon and one field gun. You don't have to run them the same even though they're in a unit. I really love them and they're mute. the models are beautiful. Standout unit for me. If you can get your hands on those weapons, even if you don't want the Cadia box set, which comes with two, even if you don't want this Cadia box set, it's a standout unit. Make sure you buy them. They're incredible. They're beautiful kits. Beautiful, beautiful kits. My second standout unit is Lord Solar Leonatus himself. So we saw the model and a lot of people loved it and hated it and it was 50-50 and the community was very split. His rules are crazy insane i'm actually going to grab the book and read you his rules out and i don't do this very often but he is just exceptional comparatively with every other hq choice in the codex he's borderline and auto include despite the fact that his points aren't the cheapest in the world ever so lord solar leonatus 
who is, hang on, 170 points for a man on a horse with a sword. Okay, 12-inch move, weapon skill, basic skill, 2 plus as expected. Strength, 6 for a guardsman is good. Toughness, 4 because on a horse, 8 wounds, attack, 6. Leadership, 10, save, 3 plus. His pistol is a two-shot 12-inch pistol at strength 8, minus 3, 3 damage. And his sword is a minus 3, 2 damage user sword. So strength 6, minus 3, 2 damage with his six attacks. He's got voice of command and regimental tactics. Pretty standard. You expect that, right? So he can issue orders. However, he has a refractor helm to give him a 4 plus invulnerable save. And each time an attack is allocated to this model, half the damage characteristic of that attack rounding up. Already very good. The college... Astralex, after your opponent has received, this is massive for competitive play, listen to this. After your opponent has revealed their secondary objectives or agendas for a battle, if your army contains this model, you can choose to change one of your secondary objectives or agendas following the normal rules for selecting secondary objectives or agendas. If you do not choose to do so, or if your battle does not select sec do not have selectable secondary objectives or agendas, then at the start of the first command phase, gain additional command point. So you can look at your opponent who pulls his secondary objectives and go, well, I'm now going to change mine based on what you've done, which is amazing flexibility because you're supposed to select your secondaries competitively in secret. And if you don't do that, you just gain a free command point, which is pretty tasty. He's got a heroic senior officer aura. So while astronomers are coins with a six inches of the model, each model that unit makes an attack, reroll hit rolls of one and reroll wound rolls of one, like a mini Gulliman at this point. He's the Lord Commander. In your command phase, you can select a friendly core or character unit or battle tank unit within six inches of the model until the start of your next command phase. Each time model in that unit makes an attack, you can re-roll the hit roll. If that unit is core, you can also re-roll the wound roll. So now he is a Gullyman stroke Abaddon. Amazing. Then commanding authority. This model knows the regimental or orders, the prefectus orders, and the mechanized orders. In your command phase, it can issue up to three orders. In addition to the normal units that can be selected for regimental orders and prefectus orders, this model can issue regimental and prefectus orders to infantry officer and militarum auxilia units, which normally can't receive them. Uh, in addition to the normal rules, uh, units that can be selected for mechanized orders, this model can issue mechanized orders to friendly vehicle officer and super heavy units. There's no reason not to take him. <clears throat> There's no reason not to take him. He's a HQ choice who's also a supreme commander. There is no reason not to take Lord Solar. He is insanely good for 170 points. He's insanely good. He, I, I don't know what they were thinking. It, I don't know. I think he's probably worth more than 170 points. He's not as deadly or as killy as Abaddon or Gulliman, but the way in which he buffs your army, the way in which he supports the Astro Militarum is huge. Giving out three orders, giving out all three types of orders, and being able to order tank commanders and, and stuff like that, massive. He's a he's an amazing unit. He doesn't even take a HQ choice because you just stick him in a Supreme Command Detachment and there you go. Beautiful. Love it. Top pick. Top pick. My third and final standout unit in this particular codex isn't necessarily one of the strongest ones, but it's the Carskins. Why? The models are beautifully gorgeous and the rules aren't bad. So they're Guardsmen with a, th a Blizzard skill of 3+, plus instead of 4+, plus, which is super tasty. We like that straight away. They have... Um, hot shot last guns for AP minus two, strength three, minus two, one damage. But don't forget Hammer of the Emperor auto winning on sixes, which is important. But they have a rule called Warrior Elites, which I really like. When you add this unit to your army, you can select one doctrine from pages 60 to 61 that no other unit from your army has. That unit has that doctrine in addition to any others that it has. You can also give them four special weapons, no more than two of each type. You can give them four special weapons. You can give them two melt guns, two plasma guns, six hot shot last guns, an additional rule that gives them plus one strength or plus one to hit or any of that sort of thing and then they're just they're just really cool that's why they're a standout unit they're just they're just really cool just deal with it i love them so the final section of the video before we go into the conclusion is the three favorite stratagems of mine and this was hard there's a couple of nice stratagems i don't think there's any that are just insanely incredible but there's there's some nice ones i've got three favorites first of all is ingrained precision Ingrained precision is a single command point. In your shooting phase, when a born soldier's unit from your army is selected to shoot until the end of that phase, each time a model in that unit makes a range attack and a modified hit roll of a five automatically wounds the target. If an attack automatically wounds the target as a result of this, then for the purpose of any other rules that are triggered, blah, 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 it counts as an unmodified wound roll of a six. So take your army, keep the born soldier's regimental doctrine, spend one CP, you auto wounds on fives instead of sixes. That's very good. I mean... I think that's exceptionally good, especially if you look at things like punishes and stuff like that. So a really nice single CP stratagem. I really like it. Big fan. The second one that I love because it just 
it just personifies the guard for me specifically krieg i guess to some extent is a stratagem called fire on my position uh, in your when a vox castle model from your army is destroyed by a melee attack do not remove that model from play after all models in the attacking unit have finished making their attacks roll a d6 for each unit within three inches of that vox castle model on a four plus that unit being roll, uh, rolled for suffers d3 mortal wounds the vox castle model is then removed from play if that model has the Cult of Sacrifice keyword, this stratagem costs 1 CP, otherwise it costs 2 CP. Cult of Sacrifice is something you can take as a Regimental Doctrine instead of Born Soldiers, plus another one. Um, so you can reduce the cost of this for Cult of Sacrifice. Vox casters and all units and just run them forward. Very Krieg for me. And then just call in basically bombs on your head. Like it. Even if you don't have Cult of Sacrifice, it's still only 2 CP. Big fan. Love it. I love the fact that he's on the radio as he gets hacked down by the raving berserker saying, just use my coordinates, hammer this position. I'm going to die anyway. You might as well flatten me. Really, really love it. And then we have uh, probably one of my favorite stratagems is two command points, orbital interference. You only get access to the stratagem if you have an officer of the fleet. And officers of the fleet we haven't typically seen. They offer reroll, I think, hit rolls of one to friendly planes essentially okay so we still probably won't see that many of them but this stratagem is wildly powerful i think and maybe i'm putting too much into this this was a hard pick because there's a couple of other really nice stratagems but this is the one that i've selected use a stratagem at the start of the reinforcement step of your opponent's movement phase if an officer or fleet model from your army is on the battlefield if it is the first or second battle round you can select one of your opponent's strategic reserve or reinforcement units that unit cannot arrive on the battlefield this phase for any reason even if it has another rule that states it always arrives on the battlefield during a specific battle round, e.g. drop pod assault, you can only use this stratagem once. So, 2CP, officer of the fleet, your opponent brings one single drop pod full of melter guys who's going to come in at your tanks. He goes, turn one, my drop pod's coming in, and you go, ah, 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 no it's not. Officer of the fleet, 2CP, it's going nowhere, it's not coming in. I actually think that's wildly strong even because in turn two you can still use it so forget drop pods that allow you to come in turn one turn two your opponent goes i suddenly want to deep strike this or bring this in or bring bring this in from strategic reserve or outflank this and you say no 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 two command points you can't you must wait until the next turn before you're allowed to bring that in i think that's wildly strong very powerful really like it actually really like that strategy so there you go there's my 15 hot takes there's my three biggest changes my three favorites my three losers not three favorites my three biggest winners my three biggest losers my three standout units my three favorite strategies i actually really like this codex i think it's strong without being broken i think guard are going to come up to maybe an a tier in fact i think it's that good overall guard are still gonna suffer from a lot of the issues that they've suffered from in the past if they get rushed by a melee army and you get into them very very quickly and you can dart through cover and use things like blood angels or berserkers to get into them really quickly their infantry will crumble the lehman rushes are more survivable than they were before and they can now shoot out of combat but they're still at some point going to end up getting pinned in and then they can't push out on objectives and they're going to struggle to do those sorts of things so horde infantry melee based stuff is still going to still cause them certain problems that's that's the way it is running in the guard however they're firepower is significantly improved they have a lot more firepower they're a lot more frightening now you do not want to be stood in the open with battle cannons targeting you it's just not something you want to happen to you anymore so i think the guard are a very nice faction now they've got some cool extra units of course we've got the new Attilan rough riders with melt lances on the charge which are quite tasty but otherwise a lot of the classics that we know and love are grins ball grins rattlings they're still in there they do a job but they're not exceptional there isn't really any one major standout unit, perhaps with the exception of Lord Solar, that you go, this guy is an absolute beast. I'm always going to include him. The guard work like the guard should work. Overlapping fields of fire, lots of units, rumbling tanks, infantry pressing forward. You have to run them like an actual army in order for them to work their best, I think. Do I think I see them rocking up to events and, and winning events left, right and Charlie, like Tau, Tyranids, etc.? No. Would I put them on a level pegging with Leagues of Votan when they first came out before the nerf? Absolutely not. Not a chance. There's no way Guard are that powerful. But they're very, very, very good. In terms of their competitiveness, probably an 8 out of 10. In terms of this book, 9 to 9.5 out of 10. The two things that stopped me from giving it a 10 out of 10. No Yarrick, sad face. No Yarrick, sad face. 
three things, sorry. No Yarrick Sad Face, no individual regimental doctrines for things like Mordians and Valhallans, which are classic guard. And finally, we still don't have new models for things like Officers of the Fleets, Astropaths, etc. They're still metal, for Christ's sake. Metal. Bring out plastic ones. You know. So in that regard, in terms of the overall codex, if I then couple it with this box, if I couple it with this box, it's almost definitely for me a 9 to a 9.5 out of 10. Now, caveat. I am slightly biased. I love the guard. This box is incredible value. With the exception of the card and codex, you could buy this box multiple times and it's fine because there's no named characters. Hint, hint, Christmas boxes, Games Workshop. You've got two squads of infantry, two field guns, one sentinel. You buy three of these boxes, right? You've got six squads of infantry, which is a battalion, three sentinels, which is your three fast attack, and three bombast guns, sorry, three units of, um, of field batteries, which is your heavy support. You do have two spare command squads, and then you convert some of these into your officer of the fleet and your master of ordnance, etc. This is beautiful. This is really well done. The only negative, the only reason why I will really criticize this particular box is the same reason that I criticize all of the limited edition boxes. Why bring out a limited edition codex that only a select few people can get their hands on and then not allow everybody else in the world to get that codex at the same time. It's just a bit of a feels bad. You can almost guarantee now that people are gonna to have to wait till after Christmas before they can pick up the Astro Militarum Codex. People then can't plan Christmas purchases, etc. It's just a bit shitty. Events like ours then have to say, I'm sorry, you can't use your new guard codex because it's not on general sale yet. That's the rule that we've set. Until it's on general sale and available to everyone, no one can use it. And that's just a bit of a shit play. This box is so good. I've said this before with other boxes as well, like Leagues of Votan. The book is so good that you could release the standard codex at the same time, and you're still going to sell the box out, in my opinion. Maybe that's just me. But yeah, the codex is amazing. I really love it. I'm a huge fan. Top Work Games Workshop. Anyway, that's my review. I want to know what you guys think. Let me know in the video description below what you guys think of this particular codex, what you've seen so far from the releases from Warhammer Community. Are you excited for this? Are you sad that it's just Cadians in a box again? Or are you thinking, no, actually, the models are so nice. I'm okay with it. I'm a person who's never been excited by Cadian models ever in my life. And I started putting these ones together and I was like, I actually love these. I'm happy to run them as Cadians. I've never been there before. That's how nice these sculpts are. They're a good job. I'm sad about the potential duplicates, but they're a good job well done. So let me know what you think about this particular box are you looking at picking it up have you already clicked my link have you already clicked the element link and gone and picked it up you should have done you should have done that uh, finally a massive shout out again to games workshop big thank you games workshop for supplying us with this box um, obviously it's not paid for content they haven't paid me to do the advertisement for them but they have sent me the box to review and i appreciate that really appreciate them supporting the channel so thank you to gw for that uh, i am going to criticize the fact that you are going to release only limited edition codex and not a standard one makes me sad but that's my only real criticism. Otherwise, this is this is a good release for Guard. It's a good release. Not to mention the fact that we haven't yet had the Rogal Dawn tank come out. We haven't had the Attilian Rough Riders come out. So we've got more exciting things to come for Astrum Natarum. It's an okay time to be a Guardsman. At the start of the video, I said, is it the book everyone's been waiting for? Is it too little, too late? It's kind of both. So it is the book everyone's been waiting for. It's very good. It's very strong. I think Guard players on the whole will be very, very happy with this book. However, it's taken far too long to get it out and there is whispers of 10th edition on the horizon and I don't think guard players will be particularly happy if they only have six months with their new codex and then 10th edition drops in their bottom of the pile again. That would make people very sad. Let's see what happens. Let me know what you think. Thank you so much for watching. If you haven't already, please make sure you hit that like, hit that subscribe, hit that bell notification so you are notified every time we go live and we'll see you in the next one.